<clears throat> so, uh, thank you for that. Uh, hands up if you can still hear me. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so uh, there was, I was shown just before this talk uh, two sheets which appear to have somewhat slightly different content leading uh, to confusion about what I'm actually talking about. So I'm just going to talk about what I'm going to talk about and I hope you're going to enjoy it. <laughs> and if you don't enjoy it, then I hope you learn something. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to cover in reality the sort of themes I'm going to cover, I'm going to give you, I'm guessing very few of you are experts on genetics. Very few of you are experts in psychiatry. So I'm going to give you a very general, hopefully light orientation to the topics of genetics and mental illness. And I'm going to illustrate this talk largely by actually by talking about schizophrenia. But in fact, the principles and the content of what I'm saying applies across the board and I will make reference to other disorders as I go. So I'm going to give you the orientation. I'm going to tell you what we've actually found in, in general terms. But more importantly, I'm going to discuss what that's telling us that might become useful clinically because I'm a psychiatrist as well as a researcher and I'm not just in this for a laugh. And then because uh, medicine and its uh, area can be a rather dry topic. I'm going to lapse briefly into the more esoteric topic of evolutionary psychiatry, which preoccupies people with a very different bent in life than I have, but people seem to be interested in it. So I'm going to briefly touch on that if time allows. Okay, so this is uh, one of two slides that will give you a brief orientation to schizophrenia. And I apologize. The only way I can see my slides is if I look that way, but I'd rather look at you. Uh, my glasses are the wrong strength for actually seeing these slides, so I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> so schizophrenia is, is what's classically called one of the major psychotic disorders in psychiatry. And typically, it starts in an obvious manifestation in people in their late teens or their early adulthood. Now, the, the sort of symptoms that people experience that are the kind of uh, the, the most dramatic ones in many ways are hallucinations, which are sensory perceptions in the absence of there actually being anything to perceive, and delusions, which is more of a kind of uh, subjective thing, but they're sort of false beliefs. And I'll give you some examples of those with reference to the pictures on the side in a moment. What most people who are not involved in psychiatry or who don't have relatives with schizophrenia don't appreciate is in many ways those are not the most damaging symptoms. They're the scary, terrifying, alarming, the, the symptoms that you see in movies and so on if you ever watch movies about psychiatry. But the really, really impairing symptoms are what we call negative symptoms. And basically a lot of people with schizophrenia have impairment in their ability to socially interact with other people. They have a low or an unresponsive, very flat mood. In fact, uh, and that, 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 that's, that can be very debilitating. And they often neglect personal care, neglect eating. And they really can become the most disadvantaged people in our entire society. Another feature that's not appreciated even by quite a lot of psychiatrists is that people with schizophrenia often have intellectual or cognitive impairment. So they're not, they can't think as fast or as clearly as, as perhaps an average person or their IQ, if, if you believe in IQs, but if measurements of intelligence are, are reduced in some, but by no means all. And often these impairments actually are evident in some shape or form all the way from birth. And this is why those of us who research schizophrenia and what I'll refer to sometimes as allied conditions really conceptualize this disorder in a lot of people as being something that happened early in life, probably whilst uh, a person is developing in the uterus. And I, I read this fact uh, or this statement uh, a year or so ago when I was preparing a different talk. According to the, the World Health Organization, Acute schizophrenia is the most disabling condition of all medical conditions, including having all your limbs amputated. It's, this is rated as producing a greater degree of personal suffering. How they do these ratings, that, that, could, be, that could be challenged. Okay, 
So onto these pictures on the side. It, it can be very difficult giving this kind of dry description of what schizophrenia is to really appreciate the degree of suffering involved. And th this, this chap called Brian Charney, who was an artist, was a, a man with schizophrenia. And he actually, his treatment was quite successful. But for various reasons that I'm not aware of, he decided to stop his treatment. And whilst he was descending into relapse into his psychosis, he kept notes of what was happening to him. And he did a series of increasingly bizarre what, um, uh, paintings of himself. And so in the, in the top painting, you can see an average looking person, perhaps slightly more handsome than average, bearded gentleman. Shortly after stopping his medicine, his, 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 his self-portrait becomes a bit bizarre. I don't know if you can see them. There's a giant mouth in his forehead, and that he describes as depicting one of the cardinal symptoms, which is having you feeling that your thoughts are being screamed out loud and that other people can hear them. And that must be pretty terrifying. There might be, I was hoping to, if you can see these little waves coming in through the window, that's supposed to depict him hearing people shouting, from the streets, talking and commenting on what he's thinking about, and that must be pretty terrifying. And it's a generally kind of blue color because he was very depressed at the time. Things got more bizarre, and so a, a few weeks later, I believe, he's painting himself as these two hollowed out eggs. And what he's describing in the text that accompanies of it is that because Everyone can read his mind. He's hollowed out. He has no secrets. He has no personal life. There's mouths on that painting, which is the people commenting on him and smiling and grinning. There's crows flying away, which he describes as being reminiscent intentionally of a scene from Vincent van Gogh's last painting, which, which is supposed to denote both his increasing suicidal ideation um, uh, but also his thoughts being dragged by some kind of machinery out of his head. And then I mean, there's, uh, there's more paintings and ultimately he committed suicide. So it's a tragic story, but if you're interested in it, there's a website at the bottom that gives all the pictures and all the way he's describing how he's feeling. Now some statistics. As kind of alluded to in the last slide, we shouldn't... I mean, when people talk about schizophrenia, it's often with a total sense of despair, but in fact, many people have a good response to treatment. But for 20% of people who have it, they remain chronically in a condition not identical to what I just described, but in some shape or form like that. But even the people who do pretty well find it almost impossible to get jobs. And in part, that's secondary handicaps. People hear that they've had schizophrenia, they don't like it, they're afraid of it, whatever. They have a very high suicide rate, but even those that don't kill themselves live on average 10 to 20 years less than someone who doesn't have schizophrenia. So it's, it's a physical health problem as well as a mental health problem. There has been no, effectively no new treatments in the last 60 years. And, that's, and the treatments that exist were discovered entirely by chance. And nothing new has really emerged. And that's largely because we don't know its origins, other than we do know that it's genetic or there's a substantial genetic contribution. So this is a slide about my own origins. I did, uh, as was mentioned earlier on, I did a training in psychiatry in, in Paisley in a non-academic institution. It was, it was kind of frontline psychiatry. I saw loads of patients. I read a book from Edinburgh, that's the, the, the thing in red on the right hand side, that was supposed to teach me about the origins and the treatments and everything that people knew about schizophrenia. And what was evident is that people didn't really know a great deal about what caused schizophrenia. So there were some speculations. There was the, top, the subject of today's presentation, genetics was thought to be involved. It was known that there was a tiny increase in risk of schizophrenia in people born in the winter months. There was a lot of chit-chat about stress causing schizophrenia. I think this is possibly, a lot of this was coincidental. If you remember the previous slide, people with schizophrenia, it often is evident in uh, early adulthood, 
And the evidence for stress was what quite often happens when people join the army or go to university or take up their first job. So that could just be developmentally coincidental. People with schizophrenia more commonly were found in cities and there was arguments raging, are cities toxic themselves or do people with liability to schizophrenia drift into the anonymity that uh, city life affords? There was some, uh, you know, some really pretty terrible thing from the perspective of the parents of schizophrenia. Parents got blamed for the origins of schizophrenia, either because they were supposed to communicate in strange ways or they were supposed to be cold or, 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 or all sorts of things that I, 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 I don't consider as relevant, but these were theories at the time. And then there was this thing, dopamine, which is basically a brain chemical. So there was some biology, some psychology, some sociology, and that was mainstream textbook psychiatry. You had stuff that was operating outside the mainstream, which I didn't learn much about. So on one side, we have Sigmund Freud, who had some uh, theories about the origins of schizophrenia. On the other side, we've got Glasgow's own R.D. Lane. Many of you will probably have read his works. I myself haven't. Um, but, and we had all this type of mumbo jumbo really going on about what might be causing schizophrenia. And the problem is people with schizophrenia do not live in many respects ordinary lives. They're exposed to different environments. They're usually poor. They're often taking drugs. They're often malnourished. You name it, anything that's disadvantageous, they're often experiencing it, which means you've got the opportunity for schizophrenia itself to be causing some of these things, not these things causing schizophrenia. But what seemed fairly certain, because you're born with your genes, is that having schizophrenia didn't cause your genes. And that's why I got interested in studying genetics. So how do we know that schizophrenia and these other disorders are partly genetic? Well, basically what, what we've got plotted here on this axis here is the higher the red goes up, your, the bigger your risk of schizophrenia. And along this axis here, what we've got is how, how closely you are related to someone with schizophrenia. So the rate in the general population is about 1%. Then if you have a parent or a sibling or a child, a first degree relative we call it, it's about 10% your risk of schizophrenia. If you have a twin that's not genetically identical, your risk is about that 5-10%. If you've got a genetically identical twin, or what we call an NZ twin, your risk jumps to about 40%. So the degree of risk follows your genetic relationship to someone else who's affected. And that's a hallmark of genetics. And the heritability here, so the, the involvement of, uh, of genes is about 60 to 80%. There's imprecision in the measurement. There is an environmental contribution. It's not entirely genetic. And if you do the same types of studies to other psychiatric disorders, you find they vary in the, uh, the relative importance of genes. So you know, even anxiety has quite a measurable genetic component, all the way through to autism uh, at the bottom, which is the most genetic of the disorders. But schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, which is a major mood disorder, they are both uh, predominantly genetic, and you've got other disorders in between. So big deal. These things are heritable. And that's what the story was when I was um, a, a young trainee. You could see that things were heritable, but we didn't know how to study DNA. So there wasn't really much you could do with that. Now, what we'd, we think we're trying to do, and it is a process, and it's a long process, is we're trying... Basically, we know, if we, we know that genes make proteins. If we can find genes that are related to schizophrenia, we know the proteins. If we know the proteins, we can try and work out what's happening in the cellular components of our body. If we can work out what's going on in the cellular components of our body, the hope is we can work out what's happening in the body as a whole organism. And by understanding that, we should be able to then, instead of just guess new treatments, design new treatments based upon a deep understanding of what the cause of schizophrenia and these other conditions is. So that's the kind of enthusiasm. This was the enthusiastic model I set out with in something like 1990 or so and spent a decade, maybe more, finding nothing. 
And the, the reason for that um, will perhaps become clear, but the old model of genetics that perhaps, if any of you studied biology um, a long time ago, genetics was essentially largely a deterministic concept. So the basic deal is you'd find a big family like that, People shaded in white are people with a disease. This is classic genetics. There's one bad gene, one faulty gene in that family. Anyone who inherits the faulty gene gets the disease, no argument. Anyone who doesn't get that gene doesn't get the disease, no argument. This is a purely deterministic model of disease. And this applies to things like Huntington's disease, for example. However, after searching for 10 years or more, myself and many more colleagues around the globe, we never found anything. Psychiatric disorders, and in fact, pretty much all common disorders, be it cardiovascular, diabetes, other common things that, that people suffer from, don't adhere to that model. Rather, they adhere to this rather complicated slide, which I'll go through slowly. Disease risk conferred by genetics is probabilistic and there are many causes. So on this slide what we've got is not many risk factors for the disease along the bottom increasing number of risk factors until you've got a lot of risk factors for the disease. If you follow the dotted line that's how often in the population people have not many people have a small number of risk factors. Not many people have a high number of risk factors. Most people, by definition, have quite a lot of risk factors. If you then follow the solid line, that's the probability that you'll actually become ill. So you can have a lot of the dotted line, you can have a lot of risk factors, but you don't become ill until you get quite a lot of risk factors and then your body can no longer compensate. The body is actually pretty well designed. It might not look it in my case, but the body is well designed. It can tolerate a lot of problems and still keep functioning and still keep functioning well. It's like straw. What's the, the cam straw in the back of the camel scenario? Basically, you can keep chucking straws on a camel, it'll be fine, but ultimately the whole system will collapse. No one straw is causing the camel to collapse. No one risk factor is causing the disease. And to find this type of thing, the tools simply didn't exist until maybe about 10 years ago or so. So there was emergence of this technology, and I won't give you the details because I'm sure that you're absolutely not interested in it, but it's simply it's got a sort of jazzy name called Genome-Wide Association Studies. Now, in order for you to understand the DNA, I've got... A cartoon, I think the DNA double helix is very well known um, amongst everyone, no matter what their background. I have, say, two copies of a gene, one I got from my mother, one I got from my father. Essentially, they're identical. But every so often, these letters denote the genetic code. There's a difference between those two copies. And that's called a polymorphism. It just means it's a variation that occurs. And we all have millions of these things. And some of them lead to disease. But because there's millions of them, it's pretty difficult to find out which ones lead to disease. We now have the technology in you, sir, you, sir, you, madam, me, to measure millions of these things from your DNA and to measure it in huge populations. And this allows us simply, pretty simply to find out which of these things are more common in people with a disorder like schizophrenia than in people who don't have schizophrenia? And that's called a genome-wide association study. For those of you who don't know the, technology, the, the terminology, the genome is simply your total body's content of DNA. When those tools became available, pretty rapidly I led this study, uh, which was the first time a, genetic find, a common genetic finding was implicated in any psychiatric disorder. Now, the importance isn't the finding. The importance was we had to study 20,000 people to make that one finding. We had to get DNA of 20,000 people. 
And clearly, I mean, actually in the first 15 years of my work, my colleagues collected one and a half thousand people. So this, to make this discovery required a serious culture change and this is reverberating throughout uh, genetics and medicine more widely. People need to get together. And so what's happened since that first study back in 2008 is that loose collaborations formed. And this looks like some kind of evil empire you might see in a backdrop of a James Bond film. But basically we've formalized structures. In 2014 there was about 35 countries involved with lots of research groups coming together in a formal way, sharing resources. By 2019, I think it's about 50 countries. Uh, I can't have lost track, about 1,000 scientists. And as we've pooled our resources, we've begun to find more and more and more. Now, the details of this next slide are not important. There's one box that's very important. But basically, what's here is I've got all the chromosomes lined up from number chromosome 1 to 22. There's a red line. If any dots are above that red line, it means we've found a genetic variation that's associated with schizophrenia. And these days, in the most, under paper that's currently been written up, we've studied 150,000 participants. We've found three, over 300 genetic things that are related to schizophrenia. The key thing from, about the nature of what we're finding is that of these 330 things we've found, every single one is common. I'll come back to how common they are in a moment. Each increases your risk. It's the straw in the camel's back. Each one is increasing your risk by less than one-tenth of one percent. So it's a tiny increase in risk. One of these is doing almost nothing. And there's much more to be found. The other disorders, depression, bipolar disorder, attention deficit disorder, autism, they're going through similar processes. They're finding similar things, but they're less advanced than schizophrenia, which is why my focus is, is on schizophrenia, because I can illustrate more. But the other disorders are going through similar processes. Now, so far I've talked to you about these common genetic variants that have minimal effects. But occasionally, there are these things we call rare copy number variants. It doesn't really matter what we call them. There's a picture of a chromosome there. Sometimes people get a hole in their chromosome, a big chunk gets knocked out of it. So they've got a chunk of their chromosome missing. They will quite often lead to medical conditions. In this case, uh, this person has got a, the name of the syndrome doesn't really matter. What matters is that instead of a minuscule increase in risk of schizophrenia, a person with this hole in a chromosome has a 25-fold increase in risk of schizophrenia. So this is like, not like putting the straw in the back of a camel. This is like putting a giant tree on the back of a camel. Camels are pretty strong, so they can cope with the trees. So they still need a number of straws, but they just can't cope with as many straws. And since th those discoveries, the same technology that I referred to earlier on allows us to look for holes in chromosomes systematically. And a bunch of these have been found now. There's about 15 of them. There's a few key properties that I'm going to allude to now and important properties I'm going to allude to later. First of all, they're rare. They, each of them occurs in less than one in a thousand people. They have these big effects on disease, but they're still not deterministic. You can have these. There'll be... You can have, there'll be people in this room with at least one of them. The, the combined total frequency in the general population is about, you know, one, two percent. So there'll be people in this room with them. You can have these things and live a, a perfectly um, high achieving life, not develop a psychiatric disorder, so they're not deterministic, but they do increase your risk a lot. So this is kind of what we've found. We've found Lots of, this is how common something is, from common to rare. This is how big the effect on disease risk is, up there. And we found a whole lot of things that are common and have tiny effects on risk. We found a whole bunch of things that are rare and have relatively large effects on risk. The shape of this curve is important, and I'll come back to it when we're talking about evolution later on. However, so far, this is just a stamp collecting exercise. We're finding things. So that if, if this is not going to do anything useful, we may as well not have bothered. So 
My main motivation for getting into this was to try and understand biology. So what have we been able to find out? Well, we've got a lot of these things. So we can begin to look right. So we've got 300, say we get 330, 340 genetic findings related to schizophrenia. There are ways where we can say, okay, which bodily tissues are those genes active in? And there are so many hypotheses about the origins of schizophrenia that that's a very legitimate question because there are even people who think that schizophrenia has no biological basis. So what you can do is you can say, well, are these genes active in fat tissue, the immune system, the cardiovascular system, the gut, the liver, etc., etc.? These colors here correspond to the colors here. And if, it's, if you see a dot above that line there, then that means the genes are active in that tissue. They're more active in that tissue than any other tissue. And the tissue in schizophrenia that the genes are active in is the central nervous system. It's that kind of, I don't know what you call that color, orangish. There's pretty much no evidence for genetic activity in any of the other tissues. So the main risk organ is the brain. Now, if I'm talking to much younger um, psychiatrists in training, I regard this as the, if you'll excuse the language, no shit Sherlock slide. Um, on the other hand, speaking to my contemporaries when I was training, there are plenty of people who were not willing to assume that the main risk organ existed, never mind that it was the brain. We can go a little bit further than that. So the brain has multiple cell types. Uh, the neurons, most people have heard of neurons, they're the kind of cells that are the process, the information in the central nervous system. They're the kind of the main, where the main action is traditionally thought to be. But there's lots of other cell types that have got important roles and we need to know what are the cells in the brain that are most likely to be uh, aberrant in schizophrenia. So by the same principle, we can see which of these cells the genes are active in. And again, it's color-coded. And above that blue line is only the big green one, and that's the cell corresponding to the neuron. So we know the main activity is in the central nervous system. We know it's in neurons. Now, neurons are quite big structures. And there's this... Oops. There's this tiny bit that I've cartooned in here called the synapse. Now, for those of you with no biological background, the synapse is the bit where two nerve cells speak to each other. One kind of releases chemicals that is picked up by, by another one. Um, and that's how they communicate with each other. And it's a, so that's the point of contact between two different neurons, which I've got a bad cartoon of there. So when we look at where in the neurons the genes are concentrated in, it's in this particular structure of the synapse. Now, the details, I think, are probably not that exciting to this audience. And in fact, uh, but, but we, we know that the signal is concentrated in this type of neuron, and we know that it's concentrated in the, the cell that's receiving the signal rather than generating the signal. Now, that's pretty much as far as our biology has gone, but that's gone a long way from this kind of vague stuff that I was being trained about, is still not deep enough to really understand exactly what's going wrong with these proteins, exactly how they could then be targeted, if at all, for treatment. So there's still a lot of work to be going on, but I think we've come along quite a lot in a relatively short period of time. And some of these molecules suggest immediately new ways of uh, targeting them with treatments. I believe that's optimistic, but um, there are some people pursuing some of these molecules now, uh, trying to see if there's new ways of treating it. But I think we need a deeper un biological understanding than that. I'm going to move slightly on to the, because one of the things that's been very surprising to psychiatrists is the structure of psychiatric diagnosis and what genetics is telling us about that. So, for those of you who are unaware, you know, if, would, would you, when you go and see a GP or a physician or someone else, and you've got a bad back's a bad example, but maybe a pain in the chest or something like that, the, the GP will come up with a hypothesis as to why you've got the pain. We'll usually organize some tests which may or may not confirm the hypothesis. You go and see a psychiatrist, you've got a bunch of symptoms, 
The psychiatrist says, ah, those symptoms fit schizophrenia. Those symptoms fit obsessive compulsive disorder. Those symptoms fit depression. And that's where it ends. There's no biologically, biological way of testing whether or not the doctor's hypothesis is correct. So diagnosis in psychiatry is a hypothesis. It's, it can be reliable, but that doesn't mean to say it's biologically valid. And given that a lot of the treatments we offer are biological, we need to begin to make biologically valid diagnoses, not just on the basis of symptoms, but on something else. So does genetics have anything to contribute towards this story? In order for me to explain how it's co uh, contributing to that story, I have to talk a bit more about what I described earlier on as these highly polygenic disorders. And this is where the high frequency of these risk factors and their small effects becomes critical. So bear with me. It looks terribly complicated. It's in fact very simple. Each of those squares with colors in it represents a different person. Now, imagine there are only 100 risk genes for schizophrenia. We know, I've already told you there's more than that, but let's just imagine there's only 100. Each of these tiny boxes represents a possible a risk gene. It's a 10 by 10 grid, so there's 100 risk genes. If, so you picture that, e let's imagine each has a frequency in the population, so 10% of the population carries one copy or more. If you've got one copy of the, of the risk gene, you get a blue square. If you get two copies of the risk gene, you get a red square. If you get no copies of the risk gene, you get a white square. Even with only 100 risk variants, there's enough ways of filling in these squares for every single person in the world to be different. So no two patients is identical in terms of their risk genetics. What's more, you can do the maths, even with only 100 risk genes, that means the average person in the population, this isn't the average person who has schizophrenia, this is the average person in the population has 20 of them. And there is no one statistically who has none. Now, you can multiply that up by at least a factor of 10, there's at least 1,000 risk genes. Not 100. So the average person probably has about 200 of these things. Now, what we can now do, I mentioned that we could measure uh, your DNA and we could do these. Using the same technology, I could grab your DNA and count how many you've got and how many you've got and how many you've got. And I can t see who is relatively more or less at risk. Where are you on this risk curve? And when you do that, it looks like this. So there's about 10,000 people in, represented in this graph. And this is, if you count up the number of risk alleles, these people don't have very many. These guys have got quite a lot. And the more they've got, the bigger the risk of illness. Now, I don't want anyone to go away thinking that we're now doing genetic diagnosis of psychiatric disorders, because we're not. Uh, without giving you the figures, this is woefully, th this is no good for, for diagnosis. You'd get vastly more people wrong than you would write if you ever tried to apply this methodology. But what you can do is say, okay, we can measure people's risk for schizophrenia and where they are on that spectrum. Is, are there any other disorders that look a bit like schizophrenia. So are there other disorders that share a lot of these risk genes with schizophrenia? When you do that, and this, uh, I have to say, none of my psychiatric colleagues believed this when we produced something that looked like this about 10 years ago now. On this graph, you've got the higher the bar is, the more similar the disorder is to schizophrenia in terms of genetic risk. Along this axis, all we've got is different psychiatric labels. And every single psychiatric disorder that we've mentioned, uh, that we've measured, 
ha is more similar to schizophrenia, uh, shares genetic similarity to a greater or lesser extent with schizophrenia. The most similar disorder is bipolar disorder, which is the kind of major mood disorder with mania and depression. But depression share is about 50% correlated with schizophrenia. Even anorexia, obsessive compulsive disorder, ADHD, you name it, they share risk with schizophrenia. If you take those CNVs, they're the holes in the chromosomes I was talking about earlier on. The ones that were the big risks on schizophrenia. Every single one that we've found so far that increases risk of schizophrenia also increases risk of intellectual disability. Yep. Most of them increase risk of autism as well. So the bottom line is that when you look at it from the biological genetic perspective, there is no neat separation between the psychiatric diagnoses. That doesn't mean to say that there is no validity at all in psychiatric diagnosis. People with schizophrenia are more similar to each other than people with schizophrenia are to someone with autism. So there's degrees of relationship. So there is some validity, but it's not a clear-cut biological validity. So this leads us to wonder, can we, instead of relying entirely on a diagnostic label, can we begin to cluster people by the degree of genetic similarity? That's illustrated in the next slide. So imagine you've got a disorder, let's call it bipolar disorder, manic depression and old money. Uh, let's pretend there are only kind of two forms of that with different biologies. So although they've got sim same symptoms, same outward appearance, internally there's only two biologies. Biology blue, biology red. Biology blue really needs treatment A. Biology B really needs treatment B. But we've got no means of telling the difference between A and B based upon the clinical picture. So what we decided to do, try and do is, if we take people with bipolar disorder, can we divide them into people who've got high schizophrenia liability? Because bipolar disorder shields risk with schizophrenia, and low schizophrenia liability. And as it happens, to a beginning approximation, we can. So if we take the population of people with bipolar, there are basically two classes of bipolar, which are more severe and less severe, and they're called bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. Exactly what underlies them is important. It's only the bipolar 1 that shares similarity with schizophrenia. Bipolar 2 doesn't. So you've already got a biological basis for dividing those two types of bipolar disorder. We can take bipolar disorder further and, and cut, divide that into people with bipolar disorder who have psychotic symptoms, that's hallucinations and delusions, very prominently, very frequently. They are qu quite similar to people with schizophrenia, whereas those that don't are much less similar to people with schizophrenia. So again, there's a point there of beginning to divide and carve up and what we call stratify bipolar disorder. So this is the start of, strat of being able to divide up disorders. And the aim is that we can then target treatments more effectively. We can understand the subgroups better. Um, I'm going to... I'll give, give you one ADHD slide here. I was going to give two slides, but I'll, I'll, I'll skip one up. So we also... I've said to you that we cannot diagnose um, and we cannot say who's going to have schizophrenia or ADHD or depression based upon their genetics. But looking to see whether or not genetics distinguishes a bit amongst people with a disorder is a different question. So challenge one, ADHD is, you know, it has its onset usually in childhood for a reasonable number of people, it begins to peter out in terms of the main symptoms by the time they reach adolescence and early adulthood. But for others, it remains persistent. And for those people, I mean, ADHD, some people view it as a, as a kind of almost a trivial thing. People with ADHD get vastly inflated rates of being incarcerated, drug addiction, loss of life expectancy, blah, blah, blah. So ADHD is a, is a serious disorder. And particularly in those where it doesn't peter out. 
So this is the slide I'm going to skip. So we looked at population of people, and this line basically, the, all these various lines here, this is age on this axis and months, and this is the degree of symptomatology on this axis. And we're really interested in the top two lines. You get people who at the age of 47 months, so that's about four years old, you get two groups with high levels of symptoms. But one of the groups, it begins to decrease by 100 months or 86 months. The other group remains chronic up till 200 months, and we haven't measured beyond that. It's the group with the high burden of ADHD genetic risk alleles are the ones that remain high. So we can, to a statistical level at the moment, not a clinical level, but to a statistical level, we can start to distinguish those people who might need more interventions very early because the other ones, to a greater or lesser extent, will take care of themselves. Now, evolutionary psychology, why people are preoccupied with this, I don't know, uh, but nevertheless, there is a huge discipline of evolutionary psychology. In my view, it's entirely speculative, but we've now got some hard data to talk about it. So there's a couple of, uh, this, this, this applies to most psychiatric disorders. Again, I'll illustrate with schizophrenia. There's no clinical aim here, as far as I can tell you. What I'm going to tell you is will never be of any clinical value whatsoever. But it is a curiosity. I'll give, I'll give the people who are interested in that. that it is a curiosity. So people with schizophrenia have, on average, one-third of the children that people without schizophrenia have got. Now, in real, sort of, in, in, in Darwinian terms, if you like, this is natural selection. If you don't have children, then your genes don't get passed on, and that disorder, those genes should vanish from the population. This is, that's called negative selection. And actually, only having a third the number of children is a very, is actually, a very intensive form of selection. It really should, if all things being equal, vanish from the population. There are very few, if any, disorders where the number of children is reduced by quite so much that where the disorder remains as common as schizophrenia is. So in order to try and explain this, there's been a whole load of creative thinking going on. Um, so some people, uh, what people like to do, I think because it's a nice intellectual exercise, they can sit around having a glass of wine and talk crap with their mates but they, and speculate back in Greek times or something like that how being, having schizophrenia genetics would be advantageous. I've given you a few examples here. One of the most popular ones is based upon the, I forgive the language, mad genius idea that schizophrenia, the people who don't fully manifest schizophrenia, but the people who are related to those with schizophrenia, they have got more creativity. And this is a benefit to themselves or society, and that explains its persistence. I've even seen someone <coughs> say that being an artist, I don't know if we've got artists, but I guess we'll probably have some creatives in here. Uh, being creative or being an artist is the male equi the human equivalent of a peacock's tail. This is a highly sexist type of remark, but the basic idea is that male artists uh, will be very desired amongst females, and so they'll mate with them, and it's like having a big peacock's tail, right? I'm not saying I buy it. I'm just telling you that's the story. <laughs> Someone else uh, proposed the Odyssean personality. Now, this is such a, a major paper that I was unable to access it on the internet, um, but nevertheless, in a manuscript that I wrote last year, I was specifically told I had to cite the Odyssean personality. Um, and I think the general idea is that uh, people who have high schizophrenia liability might be cunning, like Odysseus, maybe a bit more involved in out-of-the-box thinking, magical thinking, more cold-hearted, more detached, willing to take a risk, that kind of thing. But without reading the paper, I can't be sure. But anyway, they speculated that that would be advantage advantageous in a world plagued by terror, strife, and war. And then I don't know if anyone's read this book by Sebastian Falks, but a lot of that deals with a theory proposed by this gentleman, Tim Crow, 
The, the basic evolution of schizophrenia parallels that of language. And that really in order for the brain to formulate language, it had to become structured in such a, a way that you were liable to psychosis. I've never bought that, but there we are. So they're the exciting ones that people can chat about and argue about till the cows come home. And as far as I can see, there's very little way of showing that's true. <clears throat> there's a really boring theory that actually the thing, these genetic effects can remain common just by random chance. The, although having schizophrenia itself um, has a strong negative pressure on you, most people who carry these risk alleles, i.e. all of us, are not subject to this. And that just allows things to float around kind of by chance, and things by chance can drift to become common. So that's the boring theory. Now, looking at the evidence, so the anecdotal theory, this uh, chap back in 1931, it cannot simply be chance that among geniuses, the healthy constitute only a small minority. Uh, now, that was, this kind of works where people would read biographies of famous composers or painters and so on and conclude that they were mentally unwell. But of course, that sort of thing is open to huge bias because people who are very creative and who happen to do very dramatic or outlandish things tend to get biographies written about them. So the people who are very creative but just kind of sit nicely about it and don't trumpet it will have less written about them. These guys, however, now, do we have any accountants or auditors in the audience? Okay, so these chaps here somewhere in Sweden decided they would define people as being creatives if they were PhD level scientists or they were occupied in the visual and non-visual arts. And what they found out in a pretty systematic study, so it's probably, you could argue about the definition of creative, nevertheless, amongst this group of people, there was pretty co convincing evidence, in fact, that... Um, these people were more often to be found in the relatives of people with major mental illness. As a contr contrastor, they chose accountants and auditors who they were classified as less creative. <laughs> now, don't shoot me, I didn't come up with this, and I think if you spoke to Al Capone, he would find out the benefits of creative accountancy quite early. <laughs> Nevertheless, these people were underrepresented in the families of people with schizophrenia. And they had all sorts of elaborate things. So there's a, a story case to be answered. However, we're back to our nice genetics here. So this is the, you measure genetic liability to schizophrenia, you get this curve. This was done in Iceland. They defined creative individuals as belonging to the national artistic societies of, of actors, dancers, etc. And if that green line is the midpoint, the average genetic liability to schizophrenia, People who were creative were more likely to be on the high side, score-wise. So that is consistent with this idea that one of the manifestations of genetic liability to schizophrenia could be increased creativity. Again, they chose as the boring group executives, um, and executives were smack in the middle. They didn't have high or low schizophrenia liability. They were just normal folk. <laughs> However, selection depends upon all the effects of the risk alleles in the population. So I've already shown you schizophrenia liability increases risk of psychiatric disorders, maybe creativity. It also is associated with poorer cognition, unstable mood, various personality measures like neuroticism, openness, low well-being. And actually selection is on the, these are only some of them. Selection depends on the net effect here. And natural selection really boils down to how many children do you have that survive to go on themselves to have children? That's, it depends on reproduction. It doesn't rely upon us making a value judgment that it would be great to be creative or it would be great to be this or great to be that. It's about numbers of children. So we looked at this in a sample of about 150,000 people from the UK. We measured genetic liability and we know the number of children. And what you've got here on this axis is less, this is being slightly more than average schizophrenia liability to more and more and more and more until you get high schizophrenia liability. Up here is a measure of your number of children that you've got. 
If you're below that dotted line, you've got less than the population average. If you're above the dotted line, you've got more than the population average. And basically, we found evidence for a difference by sex. So for males, increased schizophrenia um, burden wasn't really increasing the number of children. In fact, if anything, once you got to the extreme end, it was reducing your number of children. For females, on the other hand, there was an increased uh, number of children by increased burden of schizophrenia liability. Now, that's quite contrary. If you remember the peacock story I told you, it's the males that have got the big peacock things, not the females. But if this means anything, it would be the, the women are wearing the peacock tails. But in fact, although this looks dramatic in the graph, the number of excess children is tiny. And it cannot offset the real serious reduction in the number of children that people with schizophrenia have got. So, <clears throat> I asked you to try and remember this slide, and I think given the way time is going, this will be my last slide. We've got all these things that are common and small effect. We've got these things that are rare and big effect. The way it all works, anything above this imaginary curve is very easy for us to find. Anything below that curve is difficult to find, but we needn't concern ourselves with that. Basically, if there was anything that was common that had a big effect, we would have found it. We could be pretty sure we would have found it with what we've done. Therefore, there is nothing that's common that has a big effect. This, these things are driven to be rare by natural selection. These things are kept to have small effects by natural selection. So rather than being this positive beneficial effect of all these other weird phenotypes that have been affiliated or speculated to be associated with schizophrenia, it looks more like the boring thing. Natural selection is keeping it down. There are no major benefits. But on the other hand, there's, you know, if you've got a reasonable number of these, there's no major hazard either. Some of, you, some of you might become creative, some of you might become depressed, some of you might do this, that, and the other. But natural selection is keeping it low. So it looks like the true answer is the really boring answer, and that is, it's just chance, drift. I'm going to skip this out, even though being born in winter was quite interesting, <laughs> and come to the conclusion. So, what I... Oh, uh, you know, maybe I hope I haven't been either too aggressive or too defensive, but over the years I've had to face a lot of skepticism about there being any purpose to doing uh, psychiatric genetics. So I hope at least two of you have been persuaded that despite, <laughs> that despite the shortcomings in our ways of classifying psychiatric disorders and so on, mental illness can be approached by genetics. And that there's a purpose to it, that we don't, haven't got all the answers, by nowhere near got all the answers. But we're beginning to find things that look like they'll become useful, from biology, from stratification, and even things that are interesting but not useful, like evolution. Also, genomics can be applied increasingly by researchers with no primary interest at all in the genetics of A, B, C, D, e, which is the vast majority of people. I, I was very cheered a few years ago when I read a paper the authors of which were the Social Sciences Genetic Association Consortium. Now, I personally would not have associated genetics with the social sciences, and I'm delighted to see that social scientists have taken it up. And with that, I'll finish up.